O'Meara, and this is Seriously Now In Depth. Every once in a while, our viewers ask for a longer version of one of our stories. This week, we are pleased to present Dr. Michio Kaku's How the Physics Can Predict the Future in Its Entirety. This speech was given at the Hillside Club in Berkeley last February, and we'd like to thank KPFA and Dr. Kaku for allowing us the opportunity to bring you this valuable talk. My name is Philip Mulderry. I'm going to be hosting this evening. Um, I host the Sunday show on KPFA and uh, a few years back the morning show for a, a couple of decades. I have a special warm spot in my heart for Michio Kaku, uh, and it's such a pleasure to see uh, this place full, uh, 800 people turning out for Michio Kaku. So he is actually a, a very high-end uh, theoretical physicist, and his field is co-founder of string field theory. Uh, so he works on that as his day job, and the rest of the time he's been doing a lot of media, not just explorations, his program that airs every Tuesday afternoon at 2 on KPFA, but he has been discovered by BBC, uh, the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel, um, he is a very busy man, uh, producing video uh, documentaries and series on, on TV. Uh, New York Magazine has named him one of the 100 smartest people in the city of New York. So, so uh, with no further ado, uh, here he is, Professor Michio Kaku. Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> First, I have a confession to make. Yes, it's true. New York Magazine voted me as one of the 100 smartest people. But in all fairness, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> and next year, I understand that Lady Gaga is going to push me off the list entirely. Okay? Well, today we're going to talk about predictions. I've had a chance to interview over 300 of the world's top scientists for exploration on KPFA. And let me say that without KPFA, without the work of Phil and many other tireless workers, none of this would be here. So let's give KPFA a big hand. I'm a physicist. We invented the laser, we invented the computer, the transistor, the GPS system, the space program. We invented radio, we invented television, and now we're inventing the 21st century. And we can predict billions of years into the future. So let me say that to be here today is a joy because I grew up in the Bay Area. In fact, my parents were born in California. My parents are local people, born in California. But then the war clouds darkened and Pearl Harbor came. My parents were citizens of the United States, born here in California. They were locked up, placed behind barbed wire and machine guns for four years between 1942 and 1946. In 1946, my parents were penniless. Their money had been confiscated. So they went to the boondocks. There was no place to go except one of the poorest places in California at that time, San Jose. <laughs> and that's where I was born, in San Jose. But then it got more difficult to pay rent. So my parents had to go to a place that was even more frontier, more boondocks than San Jose, and that was Palo Alto. So I grew up in Palo Alto. I used to play with the apple orchards, the wheat fields, as far as you can see, just trees and apple orchards in Palo Alto. Well, when I was young, I realized that if I was going to do anything with my life, I would have to do it myself. So one day, I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? A 2.3 million electron volt beta charge electron accelerator, to be precise. 
And my mom stared at me, and she said, sure, <laughs> why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. <laughs> so I took out the garbage, and I rode my bicycle to Westinghouse, where they have enormous amounts of tr scrap transformer steel. I got 400 pounds of transformer steel, got 22 miles of copper wire, and I went to the football field. I hoisted 22 miles of copper wire on a spool on the goalpost. I gave the wire to my mother. She ran to the 50-yard line with the wire. She gave it to my father, who then ran to the other goalpost. And over Christmas, we built a 22-mile, 20,000 gauss magnetic field. It was so powerful that if you were to walk next to my magnet, it would pull the fillings out of your teeth. <laughs> Finally, it was ready. It consumed six kilowatts of raw power. I closed my eyes, closed my ears, I turned on my power, my atom smasher. I heard this crackling sound of six kilowatts of power surge into my machine. And then I heard this pop, pop, pop sound as I blew out all the fuses in the house. <laughs> Every time my mom would come home, the fuses would be out. She'd say, okay, where's the fuse box? And then she must have said to herself, why couldn't I have a son who plays baseball? <laughs> Maybe if I buy him a basketball. And for God's sake, why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? Why does he have to build these machines in the garage? Well, I went to San Francisco for the National Science Fair. I won grand prize. And then off I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico for the National Science Fair. And then I met a physicist there who actually changed my life. There was a physicist there who was very interested in young scientists, recruiting young scientists. He helped to work on the atomic bomb, in fact. His name was Edward Teller. He lived in Berkeley. Edward Teller, father of the hydrogen bomb, took an interest in me, and he knew immediately what I was doing. I was working with antimatter. I had photographed tracks of antimatter in a clown chamber picture. He immediately knew what I was doing, offered me a four-year scholarship to Harvard, and off I went to start my career. But you know, in life, nothing's for free. After four years, Edward Teller comes up to me and says, look, we have a position open for you at MIT, Los Alamos, or the Livermore National Laboratories. We want you to design hydrogen warheads. Hydrogen warheads for the United States military. And I thought to myself, and he said, nah. <laughs> Designing warheads wasn't my thing. In fact, scientifically, I wanted to work on something. <laughs> I wanted to work on even a bigger explosion, the Big Bang. <laughs> But I didn't go to Los Alamos. I didn't go to Livermore because of the Vietnam War. There was a war going on. 500 GIs were dying per week. It was merciless. What, one day after graduating from Harvard, I was at Fort Benning, Georgia, singing, I want to go to Vietnam. I want to kill a Charlie Kong. That was what you sang at Fort Benning, Georgia in 1968. Well, I got a deferment for a while to get my PhD. I came to Berkeley. I was very confused. I had spent all my life on this single-minded pursuit, trying to complete Einstein's dream of a theory of everything. Ever since I was a child, I've been fascinated by the quest of Einstein to find an equation one inch long that would allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. That is what I do for a living. But back then, at the darkest stage of the Vietnam War, I was here at Berkeley, confused. And then I turned on the radio one day, and I heard KPFA. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I heard this new world outlook, a new way of looking at the world. So you know, KPFA does more than ask you for your MasterCard number and your American Express number during marathons. It can also, it can also change your heart. It can change the way you look at the world. It can change your life. But let me now say that 
I was still interested in this whole nuclear promise. You see, there are good predictions and bad predictions. One of the bad predictions was in the 1950s. Back in the 1950s, we thought that we would have a thousand reactors and a thousand plutonium breeder reactors by the year 2000. 2,000 nuclear power plants in this country by the year 2000. Now we only have 100. And there was so much enthusiasm, no checks and balances, everyone making predictions. Walt Disney predicted that we would have the atomic car. That's right, you would ride on a few tons of lead on Main Street. There'd be a nuclear power plant in your trunk compartment. No one asked what would happen if there was road rage and somebody rear-ended you, and you had a meltdown on Main Street. We didn't ask those questions in the 50s. And then, I was very proud, one day I found the blueprint for the atomic toaster. That's right, the atomic toaster. It had a plutonium-238, converted radiation into heat and electricity, guaranteed to toast your bread for 20,000 years, long after you've turned to dust. Years later, I actually spoke at uh, Sandia Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we design hydrogen warheads. And a nuclear physicist came up to me, very sheepish, and he said, you know, Professor, that was my design. I designed the atomic toaster. <laughs> and he never got over it, never got over that. But back in the 50s, people bought into it because there was this huge propaganda going on in the 50s. Basically, they said three things. First, radiation is good for you. <laughs> radiation is good for you because you can save on your electric bill because it'll be too cheap to meter. That's right, we'll all glow in the dark so you can read the newspaper all by yourself <laughs> at night and shut off the lights. Second, the ad said, radiation is good for you because it helps to speed up evolution. Yes, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for radiation separating us from the apes. Well, personally, I think there's some Neanderthals in the nuclear industry who, whose evolution should be speeded up. <laughs> and then third, they said in the 50s, the sun, the sun itself, don't be afraid, the sun itself is a nuclear power plant. And that's exactly right. In fact, it is the only safe nuclear power plant because it is 93 million miles away. A very safe distance to be. Well, the atom is not evil. It's not that the atom is evil. It's that nuclear energy is an unfinished technology. Look at the nuclear waste problem. President Barack Obama has canceled the Yucca Mountains nuclear waste dump. There's no place to put nuclear waste. So what do we have? In the United States, we have the biggest case of nuclear constipation in the world. All this nuclear waste backing up at all these nuclear sites. Now, some nuclear physicists say we can reprocess the waste. We can extract usable material from the nuclear waste. And it's relatively safe. In fact, one physicist has challenged Ralph Nader to an eating contest. This physicist will eat as much reprocessed nuclear waste as Ralph Nader will eat of concentrated nicotine. <laughs> eat nuclear waste. I call this the gourmet school of nuclear waste disposal. <laughs> and friends, we have finally found a solution to the nuclear waste problem. Feed it to those physicists who think that it's so safe that you can eat nuclear waste. <laughs> well, in California, we have two nuclear power plants, one in Diablo Canyon near San Luis Obispo, but one outside San Diego, right near Los Angeles, the San Onofre nuclear power plant. I did some research about the San Onofre plant. There are two units there. They were supposed to be carbon copies of each other, but when they built it, they read the blueprint wrong. They thought they were mirror images of each other rather than carbon copies of each other. So they installed the reactor 180 degrees backwards at San Onofre. San Onofre became the laughing stock of the industry. It is the only nuclear power plant installed backwards in the United States. Well, what did they do? 
They simply ran all the control rods backwards, the software backwards. Everything runs backwards at San Onofre as a consequence. So we have this backwards nuclear power plant. But that's not all. I think the priorities of the industry are also backwards. Their heads are screwed on backwards, putting short-term profits ahead of the interests of the American people. And now let me say a few things about Fukushima. It was said that a meltdown could not happen in Japan because A, they have the world's best seismologists. They study earthquakes in Japan. Yes, Japan is riddled, riddled like California. It's riddled with nuclear fa with faults, just like California is, but they have good building codes, they said. And so the Japanese will never have to worry about a meltdown because they have the best seismologists, the best construction, construction of gigantic skyscrapers. Boy, were they wrong. The latest from Fukushima is, and I was shocked when I saw this. This hit the wire services two weeks ago. We know there have been partial meltdowns before. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl. The core collapses, but still some of it is intact. It's a partial meltdown. The latest result from Fukushima is the nuclear power plant suffered a 100% liquefaction. The core completely liquefied. There's nothing left. There's no hulk. There's no remaining collapsed core. The core completely liquefied. So the core is inside the vessel. The core liquefies and spills onto the bottom of the vessel. Then it eats through the vessel. That's eight inches of carbon steel. The liquid uranium, liquefied, melts right through eight inches of carbon steel, plunges then onto the bottom of the containment. That's the last resort before you get a full-scale Chernobyl. You get a breach of containment, steam explosion, and then you lose northern Japan. Why didn't Chern Fukushima undergo a full-scale Chernobyl? We now know the answer to that. We have the detailed logs, minute by minute now, of what happened at Fukushima. What happened was, one engineer saw the reactor melt. He realized there was only one thing left to do, and that is open the floodgates and allow the Pacific Ocean to smother the core in seawater. But that would destroy the reactors, destroy the reactors with corrosive liquid. So the utility said, no, over our dead body, are you going to flood the reactor with the Pacific Ocean because we want to restart these reactors afterwards? Well, this nuclear operator, he realized, hey, the core is gone. There's no way you can salvage it. He had a direct order not to open the valves to allow seawater in. What did he do? He disobeyed orders. He disobeyed orders. There was only one correct decision made in the few days after that horrible tsunami. One correct decision. This one operator is now a hero. He decided to go against orders, flood the reactors with the Pacific Ocean seawater. He saved northern Japan from complete destruction. Amazing. A tale of, of heroism. Now also the latest results are, this was announced about three weeks ago, the cleanup operation at Fukushima will take 40 years. It will take 40 years. Three Mile Island took 14 years to clean up. 14 years to clean up Three Mile Island. Chernobyl, it's been 25 years, and they still haven't cleaned it up. You know the Chernobyl core is still melting into the earth? It's still melting into the earth. It's a never-ending nightmare. Eventually, they're going to have to put concrete under the melted core to prevent it from hitting groundwater and creating perhaps a steam explosion. Well, it's been 25 years for just one unit at Chernobyl. Here we have three units, plus two other units that were corrupted. So we have 40-year cleanup operation. And what about those seismologists? who said that, hey, don't worry about it, we're not going to have a big one. Well, you probably saw this in the wire services. CNN picked it up. It was in BBC News. At Tokyo University, they've done a reanalysis of the earthquake faults around Tokyo. Forget Fukushima now. 
Now we're talking Tokyo. The latest result is, within the next four years, there is a 70% chance of a Tokyo earthquake infinitely bigger than the damage created by Fukushima. Let me say this again. On BBC News and CNN, it was reported that there is a 70% chance of a massive earthquake hitting Tokyo within the next four years. When that happens, then we may see the destruction of a great industrial nation because there's a nuclear power plant next to Tokyo. Think of the damage that could occur. So how did we get into this mess? Because predictions have to be taken very seriously. Those are the bad predictions that got into this mess. However, today, I'm going to talk about a different set of predictions. Predictions that give us hope. Predictions that will empower us. Predictions that will make us healthy, vigorous. Predictions that can empower us into the century. Well, I'm proud to say that Physics of the Future is a New York Times bestseller, hit number six on the New York Times bestseller list. When was the last time you saw the word physics on the New York Times bestseller list? <laughs> but my previous book, next slide, Physics of the Impossible, was also a New York Times bestseller, hit number seven on the New York Times bestseller list. It talks about not just the next 50 to 100 years. My previous book takes you a thousand years into the future. What about starships? The possibility of time travel. What about teleportation? What happens if you can go backwards in time and meet your teenage mother before you're born and then she falls in love with you? <laughs> well, you're in deep doo-doo when that happens. And what happens when we can teleport Captain Kirk? And then we have this carbon copy of Captain Kirk over there. Same expressions, same jokes, selling Priceline too. So that's Physics of the Impossible, my previous book. But let's move on. Some people say, why science? Why is science so important? Well, science is ultimately the source of wealth. Yes, workers create wealth. Yes, entrepreneurs create wealth. But ultimately, all wealth can be traced to science. And so the question is, well, why did we have the crash of 2008? If we're going to be predicting 50 years into the future, can we predict the past? There we go. Great. I knew we'd get it. So the question is, why did we have the crash of 2008? Well, millions of words have been written about it. Let's take a look at it from the point of view of science. What, are, what does science say about the crash of 2008? Well, first of all, science is the origin of wealth. But wealth creates bubbles. Tremendous wealth unleashed by the Industrial Revolution creates bubbles. Money is restless. Capitalists are restless. Money has to go someplace and it goes into a bubble. And when the bubble pops, you get a depression. So let's take a look at the past. Next slide. Let's go back to the year 1800. In the year 1800, we physicists worked out the thermodynamics of steam engines. We could predict with mathematical accuracy the output of a locomotive. So that created the Industrial Revolution. All of a sudden, we had steam power generating textile mills, locomotives, machines, factories. That created the wealth of the Industrial Revolution. But that wealth had to go someplace. Where did the wealth go? It went to locomotive stocks on the London Stock Exchange. A huge bubble began to appear on the London Stock Exchange as everyone was speculating in railroad stocks. It was unsustainable. The bubble popped in 1850, creating the first of a series of big crashes of capitalism. In fact, this is the birth of Marxism. Marxism is a direct outgrowth of the crash of 1850 as theorists began to ask the question, what happened? Why did we have this crash and so much human suffering? Next slide. Well, we physicists worked out the thermodynamics of steam power. But then we were restless. We worked out the dynamics of electricity. The dynamics of electricity and also the automobile. 
That created enormous wealth at the turn of the last century. Utility stocks, automobile stocks, went right through the roof. A bubble occurred. A huge bubble occurred 80 years after the crash of 1850. And that bubble went into the American Stock Exchange and it popped in 1929. Next slide. So the crash of 1929 was a carbon copy of the crash 80 years before, the crash of 1850. Well, you'd think we'd learn something there, right? But oh no, the capitalists took advantage of the next invention that we physicists created. Bigger than steam power, bigger than electricity, and that is the transistor, the laser, and high technology. Next slide. 80 years later, 80 years later, almost to the dot, another bubble forms on, this time, the real estate market, created by the vast wealth, created by high technology, GPS, the space program, uh, MRI scans, television, radio, telecommunications, all of it created by physicists. That bubble popped just a few years ago, 80 years apart. 1850, caused by the power of steam. 1929, created by electricity and the steam and the, and the electric, I mean the gasoline-fired motor. And then 2008, wealth created by high technology. Next slide. So the next question that we're going to ask today is, what is the fourth wave? The first wave was steam power, which gave, the, which gave us the crash of 1850 and the birth of Marxism. The second wave was electricity, and that gave us the crash of 1929. The third wave was high technology. That crashed just a few years ago. What is the fourth wave? Well, we think the fourth wave is going to be a combination of biotech, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. And if this is true, we'll probably have another crash 80 years from now. So your grandkids may see another crash in the year 2090. Next slide. So let's now talk about Moore's Law. Moore's Law is a prediction that extends, we think, to the next 10, 20 years. For the past 50 years, computer power has been doubling every 18 months. Today, if you get a birthday card in the mail, you open it up, and it sings happy birthday to you. You open it up, and it sings happy birthday to you. There's a chip. There's a chip in that birthday card. That chip has more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945. Hitler, Stalin, Churchill, Eisenhower would have killed to get that chip. And what do you do with that chip? You throw it away in the garbage. When I see the pictures, 1969, of sending men to the moon, your, lap, your cell phone today has more power, more computer power than all of NASA in 1969, right in your cell phone. And when I see these old videos, I see 64K processors used by NASA back then. Oh my God, 64K processors. I wouldn't go in that tin can. You're not going to put me in a moon rocket being backed up by 64K processors. They only belong in the museum piece. Okay, that's how powerful your cell phone is. Next slide. So we physicists helped to assemble the internet. Now the internet could have been big brother. It could have been a force of repression because it was designed to fight a nuclear war. We physicists were given a direction from the Pentagon. Create a war fighting device that would allow us to maintain control during a nuclear war. That's why the internet has no road signs, no sensor, no nothing. It's just an open road. It could have become Big Brother. But then in 1989, in 1989, something magical happened, absolutely earth-shaking. In 1989, the National, the National Science Foundation gave the internet away for free. All the codes, all the passwords, all the networks, they just gave it away in 1989 because the Soviet bloc had broken up. So today, the internet is no longer male-dominated. It's not about dominating. It's not male-dominated. The internet today is basically female. It's about touching people. It's about reaching out. It's about empowering people. It's about democracy. So this force 
that could have been used to create a big brother instead has unleashed the power of democracy. Next slide. So where are we going to find the Internet of the future? Well, let's look at some of the gadgets that you will have in the future. In the future, you will have the Internet, for example, everywhere, including your wristwatch and your eyeglasses. This is coming very fast. Google already has prototypes about to be marketed. You will put on your glasses, and the glasses will recognize people's faces. So how many times have you bumped into somebody, and you say, I know this person. Who is this person? <laughs> Jim, John, Jim, I know this person, right? In the future, your glasses will say, it's Jim, stupid. You met him last year. This is the fifth time I've had to remind you that it's Jim, your old friend. And look, these glasses could be really useful. Let's say you're looking for a job. Everyone's looking for a job these days, right? You're at a cocktail party. You don't know who the heavy hitters are in the future. You will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. <laughs> You'll always know who you're looking at. Next slide. <laughs> and eventually, children will love this technology. They're going to have internet glasses because all their friends have it. You realize that children are one of the great motivating forces behind computer technology. Not so much the Pentagon. The Pentagon used to be the main driving force behind chips. Now it's children because video games is bigger than all of Hollywood. Let me repeat, video games are bigger than all Hollywood movies put together. That's how big this industry has become, and young people are leading the way. Next slide. Young people want to be in contact with each other. And here's how it works. Your glasses, which will be commercially available just in a few years now, prototypes already now being shown on the internet, they beam the image right into the retina of your eye, or they can use your glasses as a screen. So there are several ways in which the image can be beamed right to your eye. Next slide. And eventually, fashion models will wear these glasses. <laughs> It'll be fashionable to have your own internet. Next slide. In your glasses. Pretty soon, you'll have your home office, your home entertainment center, right in your eyepiece. However, let's say there's a problem. Let's say you don't wear glasses. Let's say you don't like glasses. Then what are you going to do? Next slide. We will put the internet and the knowledge of the entire planet Earth in your contact lens. This is a prototype of the future, internet contact lenses. You blink and you go online. And who will be the first to buy these? Berkeley students studying for final examinations. <laughs> they will blink, and all the answers will be right in their contact lens. This means that we professors have to stress concepts and principles rather than the, the, the parts of a flower or the chemical elements. You'll get that just by blinking, OK? Who's the second person to buy these internet contact lenses? President Barack Obama, so that he won't have to use teleprompters anymore. <laughs> Politicians, actors, actresses, they will never flub a line in the future. Who else will buy these contact lenses? Tourists. When you go to Rome today, thinking you're going to see the remnants of the Roman Empire, it's a big disappointment. There's almost nothing left of the Roman Empire. But as you walk through the ruins, you will see the entire Roman Empire resurrected right in your contact lens. This is going to be the future. You will live in something called the Matrix. Next slide. <laughs> your home entertainment center, just by blinking. Your home office, virtual worlds. Next slide. This has a name, by the way. The name is called augmented reality. This is how we will live in the future. Things will be described for you, annotated. You'll know who you're talking to. And if they talk to you in Chinese, your contact lens will translate from Chinese into English. And you will know exactly what they're saying to you in Chinese as they speak to you. So if you're in Rome arguing with a merchant to get the cheapest price, he'll talk to you in Italian, you'll talk to him in English, and you'll have a very good conversation okay, via your contact lens. Now, You've seen this before. 
You've seen augmented reality before in a Hollywood movie. Where have you seen this before? Next slide. This is the former governor of our state <laughs> in a very bad mood. This, of course, is the Terminator robot. The Terminator sees everything through augmented reality. When he sees something, it's described for you. So you know what you are looking at. You know who you're talking to. There's a description coming to you as soon as you look at it. People are identified, objects are identified. You'll never get lost. You cannot get lost because you'll simply look at buildings. Your contact lens will identify where you are, locate your exact coordinates. You will never get lost in the future. Next slide. Now, the military even has a version. Uh, this is an eyepiece that you can put right into a soldier. So this is going to be big business. Everyone is going to be wired in the future. Next slide. So with chips costing a penny in 2020, according to Moore's Law, chips will cost about a penny in 2020. That's the cost of scrap paper, bubblegum wrappers. Computer power will essentially be for free. The future of the computer is to disappear because chips will blend into the environment. So for example, where do we have electricity today? We have electricity in the floor, in the ceiling, in the walls. Electricity is everywhere and nowhere. The word electricity has disappeared from the English language. No one says the word electricity anymore. That's the future of computers. Computers will be everywhere and nowhere. We won't even say the word computer anymore. Next slide. So where will our technology be? Everywhere, including paper. This is your cell phone of the future. This is what your cell phone of the future will look like. Today, if you want to type a message on your cell phone and you have fat fingers, forget it. There's no way you can type on a cell phone. In the future, paper itself will become intelligent. You'll simply unscroll intelligent paper. Each dot on the paper is a transistor, and you'll have a perfect PC screen. Movies, animation, technology just in paper. Next slide. And this is the future of your wallpaper. Your wallpaper will become intelligent because we physicists think that chips will cost a penny by the year 2020. Now today, if you look at your wallpaper, and it's old, ratty, tattered. What do you do with your wallpaper? You suffer. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. You just have to stare at that old, worn-out wallpaper. In the future, wallpaper will become intelligent, as you see here. This is a prototype of intelligent wallpaper. You simply talk to the wallpaper and say, change color, change shape. I don't like your color. This could also give us medical care for poor people. You realize that baby boomers are getting old, poor people need medical care, but poor people oftentimes don't go to the doctor. They wait until it gets too late, and then they rack up huge bills at the municipal hospital. This is the future of medical care. You will talk to the wallpaper. You will talk to the wallpaper. People will think you're nuts, of course. You'll talk to the wallpaper, and you'll say, I want to see a doctor. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, a doctor will appear right in your wallpaper. A doctor will appear. It's an animated, artificially intelligent program. And the doctor will answer 99% of all medical questions. This is going to be how we will reduce medical costs in the future. Artificially intelligent programs available 24 hours, anytime, day or night. Let's say you have a legal problem. Let's say someone wants to evict you or somebody scammed you when you bought a mortgage, what are you going to do? Today you have to talk to a lawyer. In the future, you'll talk to the wallpaper. <laughs> and you say, I want to see a lawyer. Boom, robo-lawyer appears. 99% accuracy, answering all common legal questions. So this is how we will reduce costs in the future when we have artificial intelligence available right in your wall. Next slide. And this is your living room of the future. You will have a wall screen surrounded 360 degrees by wall screens. I took a film crew for the Science Channel down to the University of Maryland, and we filmed at the cave. 
The cave is otherwise known as the matrix. You're in a room. You're surrounded by 360 degree walls. You walk into the chamber and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a dinosaur fight. I was sitting on a Tyrannosaurus Rex in battle with another Tyrannosaurus Rex. I even put my head, for the TV camera, I put my head into the mouth of the opposing T-Rex, all in three dimensions. This is going to be your living room of the future. Now, when chips cost a penny, they're going to be everywhere, including toys. Toys will be intelligent. This is causing a problem for the English language. We will have a contradiction in terms called smart Barbie dolls. <laughs> Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft works. That is also a contradiction in terms. So this, this technology that surrounds you everywhere, some people say, well, it's kind of intimidating. I mean, it's cold, it's mechanical. But you realize that if you went to a nursing home 15 years ago, it was very sad visiting a nursing home. People would just dump their, their mothers and fathers to a nursing home, just waiting for them to die. Nothing to do in a nursing home. It was very sad. If you visit a nursing home today that's all wired up, things are popping at nursing homes. Everyone's wired up. They play bridge games with somebody in Russia, somebody in Australia. Hobbyists can talk to hobbyists from around the world because the Internet is basically female. It's about touching people. So old people love the internet, also young people. Let's say you're at Berkeley and it's Friday night and you have no date. We all know what you do, you get stone drunk. In the future, you simply go to the wall and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's available tonight? And it sets you up. The wall already knows the kind of characteristics you like. And then you go to a movie with your date, and afterwards you say to the wall, mirror, mirror on the wall, we want to see Casablanca, except remove Humphrey Bogart's face and put my face instead. <laughs> and in the future, you may even sign up for a dating service so that your contact lens will identify people in a room who have also signed up for a dating service, and their faces will light up. So as you go to the mall, as you go to class, you will see faces light up that are available and willing and interested. I tell you, man, this is big. It's going to change everything. Next slide. And it's coming very soon. Now, in this picture here, we have three-dimensional television without glasses. Now, you may say to yourself, well, that's impossible. You need glasses to see 3D. Those clunky glasses, one lens is red, the other lens is blue. Polarized glasses that are real heavy, nope. We physicists figured out how to make three-dimensional television without glasses. This is how you will enjoy yourself at night. How, do you, how does it work? The screen is where the magic takes place. The screen has thousands of vertical lines, invisible vertical lines. Each vertical line shoots an image into the left eye and the right eye giving you three dimensions. And on the left of the slide, you see the future of glass. Even glass will be intelligent in the future. If your window looks out over the city dump, you don't have to suffer anymore. You simply talk to the glass and say, please change, and boom, you're looking at the Taj Mahal. Next slide. And this is your office of the future. You will have what are called scrap computers. You'll simply scribble on a pad the pad is connected to the internet, and then you throw it away. It only costs a penny. And then you walk from room to room, and the scribble follows you. Your files follow you from room to room, room to home. Where are your files in the cloud? So in the future, a computation will be done in the cloud. And you will pay a monthly cloud bill, just like you pay a monthly electricity bill. So how do we pay for electricity? We meter electricity. We don't see electricity. It's everywhere and nowhere. That's how computer power you will pay for. Computer power will be everywhere and nowhere. You'll talk to it, it'll talk back to you. And you simply pay a monthly bill to the cloud. Next slide. 
And you see here your cubicle of the future. Beautiful surround screens that give you three-dimensional images. This is your cubicle of the future. It's so beautiful that you will never get any work done in the future. <laughs> Next slide. And this is your car of the future. Google has said that in eight years' time, they hope to market the driverless car. Tra cars without a driver. Next slide. In this car here, built in North Carolina, the car is fully automatic, connects to the internet, connects to GPS, knows its location, and has radar to look for obstacles. I had a chance to drive this car. I actually drove this car for BBC television. I went inside the car, and there I was driving the car with my hands on the steering wheel. And then the cameraman told me, the cameraman said, take your hands off the steering wheel. And I said, what? Are you kidding? And he said, no, we're filming this. Take your hands off the steering wheel. So I lifted my hands off the steering wheel, no hands, and the car drove itself. Let's do a science experiment. Tonight, when you go home, try driving your cars like this with your hands off the steering wheel. Okay. Believe it or not, this car, in this picture, is safer than a human car. It turns out that humans get tired. Humans get distracted. And in New York, humans have road rage. So this is actually safer than an ordinary car. And when, of course, you like to drive, you turn it off and you drive normally. Eight years, Google may begin to market this commercially. Next slide. And this is how you will shop in the future. Today, if you go to a dress store, you see the perfect dress, right color, right shape, right designer, right everything, but it's the wrong size, what happens? No sale. In the future, you'll whip out your credit card, shown here, your credit card has your three-dimensional measurements in it. You will email it to the factory. The factory will punch out a perfect garment, exactly the right shape, size, color. Everything will fit in the future. And of course, you will then get the bill. Isn't the future wonderful? Everything will fit. This is called mass customization. Now, Henry Ford said that you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. Well. In the future, you'll have any shape, color, size of a dress because your credit card has all your three-dimensional measurements on it. Next slide. And will you be cheated in the future? Today, when you go shopping, you never know how much things really cost. You never know who has the cheapest this, who has the cheapest that. In the future, your contact lens will scan everything in the supermarket and tell you who has the cheapest cereal. Who has the cheapest apples? And how much did it really cost to create this dress or whatever? You will know exactly how much everything costs. Next slide. It'll be very difficult to cheat you in the future. Now, all the wonders that I've shown you so far are nothing compared to what I'm going to show you next. What I'm going to show you next is 100 times more potent. And this is medical care. How will we repair our body in the future? We're going to see a revolution that's going to leave your mouth, jaw hitting the floor. Next slide. First question, how small can you make a chip? We physicists can make a chip so small, you can put it inside an aspirin pill with a TV camera and a magnet. You swallow the pill. The pill photographs the insides of your body. You guide it with a magnet because we all know what middle-aged men fear the most, the C word, colonoscopy. Well, this gives new meaning for the expression, Intel inside. <laughs> you will literally have Intel inside. Next slide. And this could be the cure for cancer. When you have cancer, it's a horrible process getting chemotherapy because normal cells are killed along with healthy cells. Now, we can create nanoparticles, molecules that seek out individual cancer cells. This is big. This is real big. It's going testing now. It's undergoing testing in Washington at Bethesda, Maryland, at the National Institutes of Health. Nanoparticles that seek out individual cancer cells and kill them. 90% efficient in one test. This is not science fiction anymore. 
We've actually created molecules that seek out home, home in on individual cancer cells, leaving ordinary cells intact. And in the next slide, we will see the final cure for cancer. Ladies and gentlemen, look at the next cure for cancer. It's your toilet. Your toilet will have a chip in it. Next slide. That chip will recognize individual genes and proteins emitted from maybe 100 cancer cells before it forms a tumor. Today, if you feel a lump in your breast, it's too late. It's really too late. They don't tell you this, but you have 10 billion cancer cells going in your body. Surgery is required immediately. In the future, this chip in your toilet will pick up fragments of DNA, proteins, enzymes from a cancer colony of 100 cells 10 years before a tumor forms. The word tumor could disappear from the English language. One of the greatest killers, one of the greatest killers of humanity may be vanquished by the same technology by which we etch transistors. You know, Steve Jobs, the legendary founder of Apple Computer, died of pancreatic cancer. Every textbook says that pancreatic cancer is very aggressive, kills you in three years, approximately. Well, the genes for pancreatic cancer were sequenced just a few months ago, and we were shocked, shocked to find that all the textbooks were wrong. We now know that pancreatic cancer takes 20 years to grow, almost 20 years to grow, but you only feel it in the last three years, and then it's too late. Then the doctor says, hopeless, inoperable, very aggressive, you'll die in three years. In the future, your toilet will tell you, you have cancer. <laughs> and every fan of Star Trek knows that there's something called the tricorder. The tricorder is a handheld device that allows you to diagnose any disease. Well, most scientists, when they saw Star Trek, said, ha, no way. How can you build a tricorder? Impossible. Next slide. Well, believe it or not, we think we can build a tricorder. On the left is an MRI machine. Huge, gigantic MRI machine. Gigantic. Why? Because the magnetic field has to be very uniform. You know, when I was growing up in Palo Alto, I had a summer job at Varian Associates. My boss, Paul Ernst, used to work on huge magnets. Paul Ernst went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of the physics behind the MRI machine. Now, on the right is the world's smallest MRI machine. It is the size of a briefcase. Why is it so small? Because computer power compensates for an irregular magnetic field. You don't need a huge magnetic field anymore. Computers will compensate for that. And how small can you make this magnetic field, and how small can you make the MRI? The size of a cell phone. This is the tricorder. We will have a tricorder in your living room. So in the future, if you feel ill at 4 o'clock in the morning, you go to the wall, you talk to it, RoboDoc appears, and RoboDoc says, oh, we have to do a scan of your insides. No, you don't have to go to the hospital. You go to your medicine cabinet, take out a cell phone, MRI scan your body, and then just email it to eDoc inside the wallpaper. This is going to change everything. Next slide. And then the next question is, what about our DNA scan? Well, the first person to have their DNA scan, it cost $3 billion. $3 billion to scan the first person, James Watson, for DNA. You know how much it costs today to have your DNA scanned? $1,000. You can have all your genes scanned for just $1,000. In the future, it'll be $100. This is your owner's manual. In your living room, you have an owner's manual for your VCR, your iPad, your iPod. Everything has an owner's manual except one thing. You. You have no owner's manual. You will have this for 100 bucks. Next slide. And what are we going to do with it? We will grow organs of the body. This is an ear. It's an ear made out of plastic. We take cells from your ear, seed the plastic, grows in the plastic, and then the plastic dissolves with time because it's biodegradable, 
leaving a perfect ear. From your own cells, next slide, from your own cells, we can create bone on the left. This is unlimited quantities of bone grown from your own cells. On the right is cartilage, noses and ears. Next slide. We can also grow bladders, whole bladders we can grow. And within five years' time, we will grow the first liver within five years. Uh, when I was growing up, my favorite role model was a Albert Einstein. And my favorite Einstein story is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him and he said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times. I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache and a beard, a mustache and a wig. I will be the great Einstein. And you can take a rest and be a chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. And the chauffeur gave brilliant talks until one day in the back, a mathematician asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> so thank you so much. You've been a great audience. to interview over 300 of the world's top scientists for exploration on KPFA. And let me say that without KPFA, without the work of Phil and many other tireless workers, none of this would be here. So let's give KPFA a big hand. Well, I'm a physicist. We invented the laser, we invented the computer, the transistor, the GPS system, the space program. We invented radio, we invented television, and now we're inventing the 21st century. And we can predict billions of years into the future. So let me say that to be here today is a joy because I grew up in the Bay Area. In fact, my parents, were born in California. My parents are local people, born in California, but then the war clouds darkened and Pearl Harbor came. My parents were citizens of the United States, born here in California. They were locked up, placed behind barbed wire and machine guns for four years between 1942 and 1946. In Westinghouse, where they have enormous amounts of tr scrap transformer steel. I got 400 pounds of transformer steel, got 22 miles of copper wire, and I went to the football field. I hoisted 22 miles of copper wire on a spool on the goalpost. I gave the wire to my mother. She ran to the 50-yard line with the wire. She gave it to my father, who then ran to the other goalpost. And over Christmas, we built a 22-mile, 20,000-gauss 20, magnetic field. It was so powerful that if you were to walk next to my magnet, it would pull the fillings out of your teeth. <laughs> Finally, it was ready. It consumed six kilowatts of raw power. I closed my eyes, closed my ears. I turned on my power, my atom smasher. I heard this crackling sound of six kilowatts of power surged into my machine. And then I heard this pop, pop, pop sound as I blew out all the fuses in the house. <laughs> Every time my mom would come home, the fuses would be out. She'd say, okay, where's the fuse box? And then she must have said to herself, why couldn't I have a son who plays baseball? <laughs> Maybe if I buy him a basketball. Seriously Now, In-Depth. Every once in a while, our viewers ask for a longer version of one of our stories. 
This week, we are pleased to present Dr. Michio Kaku's How the Physics Can Predict the Future in Its Entirety. This speech was given at the Hillside Club in Berkeley last February, and we'd like to thank KPFA and Dr. Kaku for allowing us the opportunity to bring you this valuable talk. My name is Philip Mulderry. I'm going to be hosting this evening. Um, I host the Sunday show on KPFA and uh, a few years back the morning show for a, a couple of decades. I have a special warm spot in my heart for Michio Kaku, uh, and it's such a pleasure to see uh, this place full, uh, 800 people turning out for Michio Kaku. So he is actually a, a very high-end uh, theoretical physicist, and his field is co-founder of string field theory. Uh, so he works on that as his day job, and the rest of the time he's been doing a lot of media, not just explorations, his program that airs every Tuesday afternoon at 2 on KPFA, but he has been discovered by BBC, uh, the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel. Um, he is a very busy man, uh, producing video uh, documentaries and series on, on TV. Uh, New York Magazine has named him one of the 100 smartest people in the city of New York. So, so uh, with no further ado, uh, here he is, Professor Michio Kaku. Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. First, I have a confession to make. Yes, it's true, New York Magazine voted me as one of the 100 smartest people, but in all fairness, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> and next year, I understand that Lady Gaga is going to push me off the list entirely. Okay. Well, today, we're going to talk about predictions. I've had, in 1946, my parents were penniless. Their money had been confiscated. So they went to the boondocks. There was no place to go except one of the poorest places in California at that time, San Jose. <laughs> and that's where I was born, in San Jose. But then it got more difficult to pay rent. So my parents had to go to a place that was even more frontier, more boondocks than San Jose, and that was Palo Alto. So I grew up in Palo Alto. I used to play with the apple orchards, the wheat fields, as far as you can see, just trees and apple orchards in Palo Alto. Well, when I was young, I realized that if I was going to do anything with my life, I would have to do it myself. So one day, I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? A 2.3 million electron volt beta tron electron accelerator, to be precise. And my mom stared at me and she said, Sure, <laughs> why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. <laughs> so I took out the garbage and I rode my bicycle to 